Now, as gunshots echo across the windswept, snow-covered reaches of the wild northwest, the challenge of the Yukon. <laughs> it's Yukon King, swiftest and strongest lead dog of the northwest, blazing the trail for Sergeant Preston of the Northwest Mounted Police in his relentless pursuit of lawbreakers. One King, one Husky. Gold, gold discovered in the Yukon, a stampede to the Klondike in the wild race for riches. Back to the days of the gold rush, bringing you the adventures of Sergeant Preston and his wonder dog, Yukon King, as they meet the challenge of the Yukon. shattered hulk piled up on Sullivan's Reef. Gordon, the bosun, shouted to Captain Osborne, who was seated in the stern. It's the better girl from Frisco, Captain. I know her well. She must have piled up during that storm we had two weeks ago. Right, sir. Not a sign of life. Either the crew abandoned or was drowned. There's a rope ladder hanging down. I'm going to board her. Aye, aye, sir. All together, men. Be ready to hold her off when we range alongside. A few minutes later, the captain was climbing up the frayed rope ladder that hung from the slanting deck. Gordon started to follow him. Stay where you are, Gordon. Don't let that boat get rigged. No, sir. The captain was gone for nearly half an hour. And when he started down the rope ladder again, he was carrying a large metal box. There you are, sir. Shove off. Aye, aye, sir. Shove off, men. Now pull. All together, pull. Keep her power straight into those waves, Lanning. That box all you found on board, sir? Yes, it contains the ship's paper. The captain left it behind. I'll make my report to the proper authorities and not to you, Gordon. Aye, aye, sir. Excuse me, sir. Oh, look her wait into it, Jake. Oh. When the longboat had returned to the Maribel, the whaler hoisted full sail and headed north in front of a fair breeze from the southwest. Richard Clark, the first mate, reported to the captain's cabin. Who's there? Clark, sir. Well, what do you want? Permission to change our course, sir. What for? It's our duty to report the wreck of the Vanna girl, sir. You have the ship's papers... We should put into St. Michael and turn them over to the port authorities. As long as you're on board my ship, Mr. Clark, I'll inform you what your duty is. Aye, aye, sir. We're looking for whales. And when we find them, we'll put in the port and not before. Well, if that's understood, you may return to your post. Aye, aye, sir. It was two days later that Yank shouted down from the crow's nest. Is it whale, sir? Or is Yank just seeing things? It's a whale, all right. I can see him. Uh, you'll be trim and silent, changing our course, sir. Hold her steady, Lammy. I'll have to report to the captain first. But when the mate reported to the captain... Now, Mr. Clark, we will not change our course. But, sir, it's a whale, I'm sure. That... We will find our whales to the north. You will not change the course until you receive my command to do so. But, sir, that I... That will be all, Mr. Clark. Aye, aye, sir. There was no explanation for the captain's refusal to take after the whale... And the crew became extremely uneasy when other whales were sighted and they were passed by as well. The Mirabelle sailed on to the north. Where was the ship heading? It had passed through the Bering Sea and had entered the Bering Straits. One night, Gordon knocked on the door of Mr. Clark's cabin. Come in. Mr. Clark, I'd like a word with you. Of course, Gordon. Well, sir, it's the crew. I'm speaking for the lot of them. They'd like to know what's got into the captain, sir. What do you mean? We came out after whales, and he won't pay any attention to them. That is, he wouldn't when there was some chance of sighting them. Now we're too far north, and still we keep going. It's late in the year, Mr. Clark. This is no time to be driving into the Arctic Ocean. Uh, I realize that, Gordon. Well, can't you do something about it? Well, I've talked to the captain. I'm sure I've said everything that's in the crew's mind. Well, sir... There's nothing to be done about it but continue to obey orders. 
If the man could only be given some reason, sir. Well, I haven't one. My captain doesn't choose to give me one. That's all there is to it. Aye, aye, sir. Now the wind changed, and the Maribel fought against a nor'easter, past Cape Lisburn, on to Point Barrow, the top of Alaska. And now at last the course was changed, east by south. But the new direction only meant that the ship was sailing on into the Arctic. The freezing wind from the north struck a chill at the hearts of the men. Oh, I know what he's up to now. He's going to let the blooming eyes freeze us in. He's going to keep us prisoners here all winter long. He's gone crazy. That's what I say. I've had enough of it, I have. What are you going to do about it? I'd do plenty if I had the power in your right arm, you big lummox. Here, stole that talk, Lammy. There'll be no mutiny on board the ship while I'm both. I'm not talking about mutiny. I'm talking about a nice piece of murder. Well, let's get rid of the captain and have Mr. Clark Silas home before it's too late. Now, what do you say to that, Gordon? Nothing, Lammy. You're just talking. But I'm afraid that... I'm afraid it's too late now. And it was too late. The ice caught the Maribel in Mackenzie Bay, held her in an iron grip. The roaring blizzards whitened her spars and her hull until she seemed like a ship of stone, of crystal, shining like a jewel in the sun shone, but still a dead ship, a ship unable to move. That winter, Sergeant Preston was assigned to the northwest mounted post on Hereford Island, the northern tip of the Yukon Territory on the shores of the Arctic Ocean. With the island as his base, he and the great dog king made many patrols into the frozen wilderness north of the Arctic Circle. He returned from one of them late in January. He was checking over the last of his reports on the Eskimos with Inspector Bradford when King started barking outside the barracks. Hmm. King want to come in? Judging from the tone of that bark, I think he wants me to come out. He certainly keeps you busy. You should pay him a salary, sir. <laughs> what is it, King? King barked and started away from the barracks. Then he stopped to see if his master was following. All right, fella. Just as soon as I put on my parka. The blizzard made it impossible to see more than a few feet ahead. But when the sergeant had joined King, the dog led him with unerring instinct. First to the shore of the island, and then for a quarter of a mile out into the white, trackless waste of the frozen ocean. Straight to a snow-covered mouth. A man, King. A white man. The sergeant brushed the snow aside and listened for a heartbeat. The man was still alive. It was Gordon, the bosun of the Maribel, a big man. But the sergeant lifted him easily and carried him back to the barracks. There he was made to swallow some brandy... He was undressed and put to bed, and the frost-bitten portions of his hands and feet and face were treated. But it was late that evening before the sergeant and the inspector could be sure they had defeated death. He should be coming, too, in a little while, sir. Yes. He's much better. You saved another life, King. <laughs> you found no identification? Nothing, sir. That's from his clothing. He must be a sailor. Off some ships that's icebound in the Arctic. Yes, uh, uh, Inspector, he's opening his eyes. Yes. <laughs> Did I make it? You're at the Northwest Mounted Police Post on Hereford Island. Oh, good. Who are you? Where'd you come from? Gordon. Bosun. Whaler Mary Bell. Icebound? Yes. Off Port Markham. That's nearly a hundred miles. You came all that way on foot? Am I... Am I... Am I the first? If you mean are you the first member of your crew to reach here, yes. Are there others who started out with you? No. Different times... The first was Jones. The day he shot the caribou when the captain wouldn't let the crew eat it. Put the meat with his stores. Jones left that night. He was the first. And none of them. None of them. Take it easy, Gordon. Easy. He drove them to it. Cut rations and foggies. Drove them. Drove them. That's enough. Don't try to talk anymore. Here's the soup. I'll raise his head a little, Inspector. See if you can get him to take some. Come on, Gordon. Try to swallow this. Bosun was fed, and immediately afterward he fell into a deep sleep. The sergeant and the inspector talked quietly as they watched him. Well, you've assigned me to the case, Inspector. Why, uh, you've just come in. The dogs are fresh. Of course, King never tires, do you, boy? <laughs> what about yourself? I'd like to go, sir. 
I'd like to find out what could drive men to face a hundred miles of the Arctic Ocean in the dead of winter. Well, you're the man for the job. But you'd better wait until Gordon wakes up and can give you more information. I'll get my supplies ready, sir. One thing. The sergeant went to work. At eight o'clock the next morning, he was ready to start. And Gordon described the position of the ship as well as he could. Then... You won't find many of them left. Those who died and those who tried to make it here. There was just the captain and Mr. Clark and Limey and Yank when I left. Maybe you'll find only the captain. I warn you, Sergeant. Something's happened to him. Something's gone wrong. We'll find out, Gordon. And we'll do our best to help your friends. One King. It was 8 o'clock in the morning. But it would still be night in the Arctic for another three hours. And as King took his place at the head of the team and the sergeant stepped on the running board of the sled, the only light came from the stars and the northern lights. The blizzard was over, and yet the trackless miles ahead were beset with danger and death. The sergeant gave the command to hit the trail. On King, run! continue our story in just a moment. Now to continue our story. Even with King breaking the trail, it took the sergeant nearly three days to reach Point Larkin, and still another before he saw the icebound ship. It was midnight. The aurora had left the sky to the cold and distant stars. There was no wind, and the silence was intense. The sergeant didn't want to announce his coming to the men on board the ship, so he called out an order to King. It's a thing quiet, boy. A growl from King was enough, and not once during the last half mile did the dogs bark. When the sergeant stepped on the brake, King needed no command to stop. Good boy, King. No one's heard us. I'll unharness the team and feed them and see about getting aboard. <laughs> Even as the team was fed, King maintained his discipline and refused to let them make a sound. They ate their ration of frozen fish and burrowed in the snow to sleep. But King stayed by his master's side as he circled the ship. There's a light coming from that port all forward. Must be the crew's headquarters. I want to talk to them before I talk to the captain. Oh, rope ladder hanging down from the deck. Looks like you'll have to stay here. Don't you like the idea, boy? Well, I'm second thought I might be able to carry you up. Let's try it. Oh, you're a heavy one, King. Let's go. With King under one arm, the sergeant climbed the ice-crusted rope ladder to the deck. Now forward, boy. When the forward hatch was reached, the Maori found it closed and impossible to open. He knocked on it. Who's there? Open up. Is that you, Captain Osborne? Sergeant Preston, Northwest Mounted Police. Northwest Mounted? Oh, blimey, one of their majesty's own. Yeah, stepped on into our castle, Sergeant. Blimey, what say you got with you, Wolf? My lead dog. Mind if he comes down with me? Close that hatch, Limey. All right, sir. One king. Sergeant, you're both as welcome as the flowers in my... How do you come to be here? Don't tell me one of the boys might have to her for an island. Gordon made it. Who's that with you, Lammy? Sergeant Preston of the Northwest Mounted Police, Mr. Clark. Gordon made it to her for an island. Oh, it's good news. I'm glad to see you, Sergeant. Uh, have you talked with the captain? No, to tell the truth, Mr. Clark, I wanted to talk to the surviving members of the crew first. I didn't expect to find the first mate in the forecastle. I've been living here for two months, Sergeant. Huh? How does that happen? Well, the captain had all the ship's stores moved into my cabin... It was next to his. Close. So as he could keep an eye on her. There was plenty of room here, but... He's one of us, Mr. Clark is, and no matter what Gordon says, you can talk free and easy with him, Sergeant. I'm glad of that. I want to know what's happened to this ship. There's been a curse light on it. And the curse is known as Captain Osborne. I'd like a few more details, Mr. Clark. Gordon must have told you a great deal. Yes. You passed by every whale you sighted. You kept sailing north long after you should have turned south captain's orders. And after the ice closed in, the harsh treatment and half rations made one man after another desert. Five of them died, Sergeant. They're buried out there. I see. There were six who deserted. Couldn't you have stopped them? 
Not unless I put them in irons. Eleven dead. Not Gordon, bless him. And perhaps not some of the others. There were a number of Eskimo villages on the shores of the bay, and they may have found shelter there. We'll find out. Now, uh, what about Yank? Gordon said he was still here. He is, in his bunk. Poor blighter. Is who? He has been. His fever's down. We only had some proper food. Bully beef and odd tack. You can't expect some man to get well on that, Sergeant. There's nothing else on board? Not that the captain will give us. And what about the Caribou Jones shot? He probably ate all that himself. Can goods, mister? Well, I haven't seen a straw since they were moved into my cabin. Well, I'll see them. Gordon says the captain's crazy. What do you think, Mr. Clark? It's perfectly rational. Well, something's wrong. He's accountable for everything that's happened on this voyage. He must realize he'll have to answer to the owners and a board of inquiry. Well, if he kills us all off and there's no one to testify against him, he can say there was a mutiny. No matter what he says, they'll be through. He'll never get another command. Why should he throw away his career for what? I won't say crazy, Sergeant. There's something wrong. And has been, Mr. Clark. Ever since he went aboard the wreck of the Banner Girl and pinched that box of papers. Box of papers? Banner Girl wrecked on Sullivan's Reef. The captain went aboard and came off with a box. He said it contained a ship's papers. Have you seen them, Mr. Clark? No. I told him they should be delivered at the first port we could make. But I was overruled. I'm interested. I'm ready to talk with the captain now. Will you come with me? I'd be glad to. <laughs> You'd better stay here, King. Well, that's right. You stay here and keep me company. A Yank's asleep. He won't need anything for a while, I mean. All right, sir. And Sergeant... Yes, Lyman? Give it to him. Good. The Sergeant and Mr. Clark climbed the hatchway to the deck and made their way aft. A few moments later, the Sergeant was meeting Captain Osborne. His reception was unfriendly. What do you mean, sir, coming aboard this ship without permission? I have business with you, Captain. And state it and be done with it quickly. You're anchored in Mackenzie Bay and are therefore subject to the police regulations of the Northwest Territory. What's that? Surely you'll know where you are. We're in the Arctic Ocean. Consult your charts, Captain. If your navigation's been accurate, you'll find you're in Mackenzie Bay. What of it? I explained. None of your laws have been broken. I've been informed you have property in your possession that doesn't belong to you. That isn't true. The ship's papers of the Banner Girl, Captain. Uh, so you've been talking, Mr. Clark, eh? Yeah? I've repeated your own statement, sir. I'll take charge of the papers now, Captain. There are none. But Captain, I repeat, there are none. Yeah. Here is the box I took from the Banner Girl. When I inspected it closely, I found that the papers it contained were nothing but worthless memoranda. I've disposed of the trash, and I'm using the box now for my own personal correspondence. You can see for yourself, Sergeant. Yes, I shall report your action. As you wish. Now then, if that's all... It isn't. The Northwest Mounted Police are authorized customs officials in this territory. I want to look at your cargo. We have no cargo. And your stores. My stores? Yes, Captain. You won't find many. Mr. Clark can show you where the storeroom is. I know where it is. May I have the key to the next cabin? Certainly not. You refuse to submit to customs inspection? There's nothing to interest you in the next cabin. I'll decide that for myself. Well, if you're going to be obstinate, all right. I'll unlock the door for you. Come along. Better bring the lamp, Mr. Clark. Right, Sergeant. Here's the lamp, Sergeant. You can see there's nothing contraband in here. That's frozen meat, isn't it? Yeah. Canned goods, white flour, potatoes. You could use some of this to feed that sick man in the forecastle, couldn't you, Mr. Clark? I most certainly could, Sergeant. You'll allow him to take what he needs, won't you, Captain? No, I won't. My word is final concerning the distribution of stores on this ship, and I say... Just that a moment, Captain. No one argues the fact that you control the stores. But because of that, you're responsible for the lives of the men on board. You're responsible for Yank's life. If he dies and it's proved that you had the means to prevent his death, a jury might call it negligent homicide. Utterly ridiculous. I'm going to stay here until Yank recovers or dies. I'm going to observe the treatment he receives. If he dies, I shall consider it my duty Mr. to place you... Clark. Yes, sir. Take what you need for the sick man. From now on, the responsibility for his care is yours. Is that understood? Yes, sir. 
Are you satisfied, Sergeant? For the time being? Then I have a question. How did you happen to come here? Gordon made it to Hereford Island. It seemed that help was needed. I see. That's all I wanted to know. When you finished in here, Mr. Clark, return the key to me. By the time the sergeant and Mr. Clark returned to the forecastle with fresh supplies, King was finding the heat from the cherry red stove too much for him, and the sergeant let him out on deck. He burrowed in the drifting snow, but although he was tired, he didn't sleep. There was something about this strange, silent ship that made him uneasy. And when he saw a man come up on deck toward the stern of the ship, he growled in his throat. There was something furtive in the man's actions. And even if he could have known what the man was thinking, King's sense of danger couldn't have been more acute. The captain leaned over the railing and stared at the sled and sleeping dogs below him. Game's up, huh? There's no chance to get rid of these other three with a Marty watching over them. Gordon's already safe. Safe to testify I took the box from the Banniger. He doesn't know what was in it, but the owners do. There's only one way to keep all that money for myself. Escape and disappear. And there's only one way to escape. A dog team down there. I have a compass. I can make it to Aklavik. Get fresh dogs and drive south. Yeah, I'll wait until the Marty and the others are sleeping. But when I try to harness that team, they'll boy. They'll wake the Marty up unless... Unless he can't wake up. Yeah, it's the only way. Kill them all. The captain descended to his cabin... From underneath the mattress of his bunk, he took a money belt. And by the light of the lamp, he counted the yellow back bills it contained. Fifty thousand dollars. And mine, if I can only get away. The captain waited. A new thought came to him. Before I leave, burn the ship. They'll think I died, too. Start with a new name. A new name and fifty thousand dollars. Fifty thousand dollars. Three hours passed. The captain checked his revolver and climbed to the deck. He leaned over the railing and made sure there was no light shining from the forecastle porthole. The time had come. He started silently toward the bow of the ship. King, almost completely buried in the snow, was watching. He could see the glint of metal in the man's hand, and he knew that he was carrying a gun, the weapon that hurt his ears and filled his nostrils with an acrid, biting sting, the weapon that could produce red-hot pain... An old wound in his shoulder throbbed and heightened his sense of danger. The man was almost on top of him. He sprang to his feet, blocking the back. The dog, eh? Get out of my way, you one. Here's one way to take care of you. The captain leveled the gun and fired. But King had leaped aside behind the shell of the hatchway. The captain fired again. A shot that splintered wood. By now the dogs were awake and barking. Sergeant Preston came charging up the hatchway. The captain whirled and fired at him. The shot went wide. But the sergeant fired and caught the captain in his arm. He turned and ran. The first part of his plan had failed. But in his twisted brain there still seemed a chance of success. To carry out the second part of his plan. To fire the ship. He plunged down the companionway toward his cabin and wrenched open the door. The oil lamp still lighted was on the table. The captain grabbed it and smashed it to the floor. Flames shot up. The captain turned to run, but King was blocking the door. No, no. Nothing's going to stop me. With his left hand holding the gun, he fired. Once more, the bullet missed its mark. The captain's strength was gone. The gun slipped from his fingers, and he sank to the floor, clutching his right arm. A second later, the captain, Sergeant Clark, and Limey were in the cabin, stabbing out the flames. Sergeant! And half an hour later, the captain was lying in his own bunk, his arms set and bandaged and sleeping under the influence of a sedative. But his delirious talk and the bulging money belt had revealed the whole story. He wanted the whole 50000 for himself. He didn't care how many lives he sacrificed to get it. Yes, he hoped it all deserved to die. We might have if it hadn't been for you, Sergeant. If it weren't for Gordon, I wouldn't be here. And if it weren't for King, 
None of us would be alive. Well, that's right, Sergeant. The hatch wasn't bolted. The captain could have crept down the forecastle without a sound. I knew King was on guard. Courage, brains. It's a wonderful dog. You've proved yourself again, King. <laughs> it's thanks to you, boy, this case is closed. <laughs> Radio dramas are created and produced by George W. Trendle, directed by Fred Flowerday, and supervised by Charles D. Livingston. The part of Sergeant Preston is played by Paul Sutton. This is J. Michael wishing you goodbye, good luck, and good health. So long. <laughs>